Welcome back to another episode of the 5G Guys. I'm Wayne Smith, joined by my co-host, Dan McVall. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to 5G Guys. We're excited today for our guest, Jeff Hipchin of RF Connect. Um, he's going to share with us his experience on private wireless networks, some of the use cases he's seeing out there, both uh, with direct involvement as well as uh, some other projects that he's seen going on in the, the industry. Um, we, we asked Jeff to join us because... He's got more than 30 years of experience as an executive and an entrepreneur in the uh, the wireless industry. And he's one of the principals of RF Connect, which is a 19-year-old company um, that focuses on the design and deployment of high-performance public and private wireless networks. So who better to tell us about what's going on in the private network space than, uh, than Jeff himself? So Jeff, thanks for joining and uh, looking forward to having you on the, on the episode. Yeah, well, thank you, uh... Daniel and Wayne, I appreciate it. I look forward to it. So start off by telling us a little bit about the history of your company um, and kind of how you guys came about and bring bring us to where you're at today. Yeah, appreciate that. So uh, my business partner, I had, had known each other for a number of years in prior businesses. Uh, we had sold those and roughly, as you mentioned, 20 years ago, we we're looking for something new to do. We're entrepreneurials. At, uh, at heart and uh, what we didn't want to do is go back to doing what we had been doing, which was network integration, TCP IP switches, routers, firewalls, etc. And one of the things that uh, we had a little bit of experience with and kind of saw as exciting times ahead was mobility and in particular wireless. And so the first year after we formed the business was we just started going to shows, talking to people that we knew um, to get an idea of what in wireless we should be doing. And out of that um, came a couple of ideas that sparked, um, you know, Wi-Fi was a natural, of course, and some point to point, point to multi-point backhaul opportunities that we uh, got involved in. But over the years, the one area that really settled in for us was uh, you know, kind of cellular enhancement. And we started off with small repeaters and that evolved to providing uh, high-end uh, solutions, neutral host solutions in all types of venues. We've done just about everything you can think from high-end homes to uh, stadiums, arenas, campuses, and uh, it's been exciting. And, and with it, as you guys know, the evolution of the mobile phone from analog to digital communication and 3G to 4G and now we're at 5G and they're already starting to talk about 6G. So so tell me a little bit more about a lot of the experience you talked about just now was, you know, public venues and enhancement of those venues. Historically, has that been uh, uh, directly providing cellular service enhancement for, you know, the, the public cellular carriers? And, and if so, how has that changed, if at all, um, more recently to private networks and, and explain to our, our users maybe the difference a little bit. Yeah, sure. So you, you spot on. So as we evolved it, we actually uh, over 15 years ago did a lot of work for the carriers. If you were fortunate enough to be a high-end customer for them, often they would uh, put in a system uh, in your headquarters, in your offices to make sure that their particular services uh, worked as well as uh, as you mentioned the public venues you know airports stadiums arenas um, subways things like that they want to make sure that the uh, quality of service the customer experience was uh, you know at, at me reaching their KPIs and so forth so we did a lot of that work um, and then like any industry things evolve and we started moving more towards uh, away from the carrier funded solutions uh, and focused on providing solutions that helped end users directly because they had needs and in some cases they may or may not get carrier funding, but they still wanted to provide a solution uh, in those. And th those types of verticals were higher education, healthcare, large commercial real estate venues, uh, and so forth. But uh, uh, so what we've seen is more and more over the years, the enterprise accounts wanting to get uh, a stronger position because they typically didn't want just one carrier solution provided in, in, in their particular venue. Um, it became more of a situation where it was bring your own devices. 
And as we all know, the number of devices have increased from just cell phones to tablets uh, to your uh, computers and so forth. And with that, um, they wanted to make sure that the uh, experience of their employees, visitors, uh, customers, etc., cetera, um, was uh, satisfactory. And so we found a nice niche where we were providing and helping, uh, you know, basically become uh, subject matter experts to our customers to help them through the process of figuring out, you know, should it be public cellular, i.e. today's world, predominantly AT&T, Verizon, uh, and T-Mobile, um, and, you know, now Dish and uh, Comcast and Cox and others are starting to uh, um, have, a, have a bigger uh, presence and so forth. But uh, the key three still dominate that marketplace, and they wanted to make sure that uh, they had satisfactory coverage inside those venues. And, and well, I, I can't forget that public safety has now become even more critical um, as, you know, no to surprise in today's world. But uh, some standards got passed, first net by the U.S. government and uh, more so the uh, AHJs, authorities having jurisdiction, have started requiring it more and more to get the certificate of occupancy. So that's been a another area that's been an uh, increased importance in providing solutions within buildings. So I think a good thing, maybe to step back a bit uh, and dive a little bit deeper, you know, you mentioned BDAs, new, you know, we talk, we haven't talked about neutral host and private network, but, you know, for our listeners, t take us through a, a quick uh, overview of the technology evolution, you know, from the world of BDAs to private network. Yeah, so when we first started 20 years ago, the requirement was more about coverage, you know, getting the signal to penetrate the building. And that was true whether it was public cellular, uh, private cellular, and public safety. You know, as buildings have increasingly um, improved on efficiency, you know, lead certifications and so forth, the focus on that, those same attributes uh, attenuate the signals from penetrating the building more and more. So it be, has become a greater issue. Now, in the meantime, in parallel with that, the cellular services, public cellular services have migrated from analog to digital. And then as the digital has taken off, you have, they want to get the digital services and it switched to D TCP IP, which we all know is a common standard in networking is moving that digital signal closer and closer to the user. And so the issue with that then um, became more about capacity, you know, performance and bringing bandwidth, much like you, we've all seen and experienced with Wi-Fi. You know, it's not just a connection anymore. You want a good connection and you want to meet the KPIs that you have because you're running more and more applications. And what really kicked this off even more so was the advent of the smartphones, smart devices, i.e. the iPhone. Um, you know, that really, now it went from just a voice application being used on these networks to so much more. And, you know, we're all familiar with all the applications and they're very video sensitive and uh, bandwidth uh, usage sensitive. So, so you talked about um, a lot of the historical projects like this that you've worked on in different venues. Um, and when you talked about it, you talked about how we're enhancing the service of the big three, whether it was that the big three were paying for it or the enterprise or venue themselves was paying for it. But it was still, quote unquote, a public network from the standpoint of anybody with the phone that went into that building would benefit from that network that you designed and built, correct? Yes, correct. Right. Yeah. So, so talk about what that transition has been over the last, I don't know, two, three years to private networks. What a private, what's different about a private network? Absolutely. So, um, what we've seen is, uh, actually about six years ago, we hired a chief innovation officer and we hired him from outside of the industry is actually his history had been and career had been focused on applications and government and so forth. So more of a software person. And we told him, take a year. We kept him out of our primary business. He knew enough about it to be dangerous, but we didn't uh, integrate him into our day-to-day -day business operations. We wanted him to go out with uh, 
fresh eyes and look and see what uh, opportunities might be out there for us. And uh, after a year, he came back with a number of ideas. And in discussing those, we narrowed them down. And ultimately, what we settled on was private wireless networks and specifically CBRS. And in, in, with the private wireless network and CBRS, what we're utilizing uh, in the government in the meantime was developing standards with the uh, FCC where they uh, released uh, bands, and that's the CBRS. CBRS is a band which in which a private wireless network can run over it. And um, it's a big uh, slice of bandwidth that at the time they came up with this, it was actually more bandwidth than a, a lot of the carriers had owned, you know, in which they lease. And so it was a great opportunity. And what that does is the way they structured that is it acts as uh, very similar to license bandwidth. And so you get the advantage of being a unique user on that bandwidth when you're using it. You can use higher powered radios. Um, and so your signal to noise ratio, not trying to get technical, but signal to noise ratio is greatly improved. You can use more power, you get greater performance. And then on top of it, the technology that they've utilized and chosen is uh, 3GPP standards, uh, which means for the uh, common person that, you know, it's a cellular technology. So you pick up the benefits of cellular where, you know, if you want somebody to be on your network, they have to be issued a SIM or eSIM to access it. And the other advantage with uh, cellular is that from day one, it was designed for mobility. So you get the benefits of smooth handoffs when somebody's roaming your building or outdoors roaming from um, connection to connection. And with this eSIM, the security is uh, greatly improved over Wi-Fi. It's never been hacked. And then also you have pick up the advantage of low latency, which has a big impact on a lot of key applications. This episode of 5G Guys is brought to you by Vertex Innovations. For almost 20 years, Vertex has been building the nation's wireless and broadband networks. Providing project management, network engineering, and construction oversight are just some of the ways Vertex helps its clients. So if you're in need of a partner to help you with your wireless network designs, construction, implementation, or operations, reach out to Vertex. You can find them at vertex-us.com. So I think a good thing, that, you know, a good question to ask is what do the, the public carriers think of private network? <laughs> that's a, that's a, a, it's still a very good question and it's mixed. Um, there was an auction so with CBRS, when they, they had an auction a couple of years ago, and it's a public auction, but the FCC structured it so that no particular party could dominate it as easily as they have with other uh, license or bands when they've auctioned them off. And what they did that regard is they blocked off almost half of the available frequencies for what they called general availability. So nobody can um, have pure ownership of that. It's a um, you know first come first serve approach there. And then the other half they did auction off, but they limited the auction to by county. And so whoever you know, so it meant there was a lot. I'm not sure how many counties there are in the country, but each county auctioned off a half of the bandwidth uh, that available in that spectrum and. Um, it made it much harder for one entity to come in and gobble up and uh, um, take over. So it has allowed the private user and enterprise to have a good chance one way or another, whether they own it or use the general availability bands to um, have their own network. And, you know, with your own network, what it allows you to do and be your own carrier, basically, is it gives you the ability to control your own destiny and run what applications you want. And when you own it, the cost of ownership compared to a usage-based or device-based cost is usually um, significantly less. So for, for our listeners, you know, uh, Jeff, you, you mentioned the acronym for this, this spectrum that you've been talking about is C CBRS. And CBRS literally stands for Citizens Broadband 
radio service. So it was the intent all along by the feds to to have this be a method by which the citizens of the United States could kind of take control of their communications through this the spectrum, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. yep. So give us so give us some examples then of um, maybe some projects you all have been involved with in deploying these these types of private networks. Yeah, and there's quite a number of them and across a lot of different verticals, but some of them are in the higher education area. We're seeing where um, there's interest in um, extending their surveillance to areas where they might not have fiber. So by deploying a fixed wireless network um, across that, they can extend the surveillance coverage across the campus to areas that just would be not would be cost prohibitive to run fiber to it. Um, they can extend their blue box security uh, calling areas for safety across the campus for the same reason, digital signage. Um, one of the unique opportunities, again, with uh, public venues, i.e. football, it's football time of the year, um, a number of the stadiums, you know, they're only occupied maybe 5% of the year, you know, eight, 10 home games a year. Um, what happens is you don't, when it's, when it's empty, there's nobody there, great performance for the cellular coverage, for example, and Wi-Fi coverage. But then when you pack it with 100,000 people inside the stadium and another 100,000 outside, all of a sudden, even when uh, there might be a distributed antenna system with some capacity there. It still overwhelms it, and it poses some problems for uh, their internal communications, for services. Uh, point of sale is a big one. I know a number of high-end Big Ten stadiums that uh, on game day, they can't accept credit cards, which in today's world, you know, we're all digital. A lot of people don't carry cash. They require cash to, you know, buy souvenirs, to buy, you know, um, beverages and so forth. And that's just, you know, it just seems great, crazy. And one of the things you, we found is the application for private wireless has allowed them to continue to have the public cellular and Wi-Fi um, performances and utilizations. But then on their own, they can make it a private network where they're running point of sale. And with a low latency, they can run, you know, credit cards and validate them in quick order and then go back to having a system where they can offer uh, credit card services. Um, in most stadiums also, the communication from the booth down to the field in many cases is private wireless now. Um, so those are some. In golf, uh, the PGA is utilizing private wireless to get the statistics updated when you're watching that uh, broadcast and they're telling you, oh, so-and-so hit it how many yards and their accuracy and this and that, a lot of that data is being run over tablets and so forth um, live on the golf course on a private wireless network. And then moving to healthcare, which is a real exciting one, we're seeing uh, internal communications uh, the healthcare, the hospitals are frustrated because they can't get the performance they need um, for patient data. Uh, and what they're moving towards is, again, deploying their own private wireless network and breaking that off from the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, you know, with private wireless, we're not suggesting that it replace Wi-Fi or other services. Again, in the need and endless capacity requirements that we see, it's, uh, yeah, you know, it complements it. And so they're breaking off their voice applications and patient records because they get better security. They can roam around with a single device and have smooth handoffs throughout the facility. Um, and it's much more secure. So that those are a couple. Um, another one I, I want to mention because it's kind of exciting. It's uh, close to Wayne, uh, UC Denver and their Colorado Smart Cities Alliance, we've been working with them and deploying um, in their facilities in downtown Denver. And they've got a couple of really neat uh, uh, use cases. And one of them is robot remote controlled snow plows. And this sets it up so that they can, uh, they have a customer in their incubator that's uh, testing that live. Another one is, uh, to assist uh, blind people in public buildings, rather than creating sensors and building out a sensor network, 
they're testing it so that uh, they can, with a cane, allow the, the, uh, uh, the, those that need it to have uh, uh, spatial awareness as they enter a public service building. And um, another one is just asset tracking. And you know, when, when you need something to be able to follow it, like robotics, automated guided vehicles, where you don't have the luxury of, uh, you know, latency and delay, you need the quick responses. That's another use case that's uh, uh, really seeing hit, hit it out of the ballpark. Those are uh, great examples. I, I think one of the things that comes to mind is I hear, hear the examples is I hear some use cases where um, you could really envision and see the, the need for, for 5G when you talk about low latency, right? Yep. You've got a, yep. an autonomous robot or a, a vehicle like a snowplow that has to be able to respond quickly to its environment and not create an accident. Those are cases where 5G clearly, because of its capabilities, are, are, is important. But talk about, in your opinion, do you run into use cases for private networks where maybe 5G isn't necessarily the best technology? Uh, and, and why would that be if that's the case? Yeah, and that's a, a good point that we run into on a reoccurring basis even now is once you go with a private wireless network, the advantages you pick up of not having to contend for other users, you're controlling the users, the radios, the noise on your network. What we're seeing is usually, because we go into it agnostically, talking to customers to understand their business problem and what are the, the pain points and what are they trying to solve. And in most of the cases, I'd say probably 90% of them right now, we find that 4G and the performance it provides is adequate, more than adequate for the, the business need. Um, you know, 5G is continuing to evolve and it still has its place. And again, we're not saying one has to be better than the other or replaces the other. But when you look at the cost right now, that's the big differentiator is the cost to deploy a 4G network uh, because of the available products, uh, user equipment, radios and so forth is still quite a bit less than what it takes to uh, deploy a 5G network and the limited benefits you get with that, which, you know, a little bit better performance on latency, a little bit more capacity, again, with the nature of a private wireless and thus the importance of controlling your own destiny so you can, can move from 4G to 5G when you want to and not rely on when a carrier wants you to do it. Um, it's still very, it's more cost effective to deploy a 4G network. So one of the things you said that comes to mind, um, you said that private networks not necessarily replace Wi-Fi or public cellular networks. And so when I hear that, I mean, it's a really good point and I guess when we talk about larger venues, what you're, are you saying that all three technologies have a different use case and are needed in those venues? Absolutely. If nothing else, just for additional capacity bandwidth to run the applications that customers are, but they are, you know, Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi. It's, you know, the, the least cost uh, approach because it's so prevalent and so many devices have Wi-Fi radios built into them. It's, you know, you look at your home, your your refrigerator, your washer, your dryer, your, your, your security cameras, your printers, your TVs, all have Wi-Fi in them. So that's the good news. And likewise in the commercial environment, just about every device has it. If you look on your phone or your, your PC and you turn your Wi-Fi radio on, you know, how many networks pop up. So that's the good news. It's low cost of entry. It's, you know, commercialized, readily available, but there's a price for that. The price is you have all these devices, all these radios out contending for space, and that affects the performance, which affects the capacity because of all the noise. You know, the analogy I'd use is if you're sitting in a, uh, uh, a, um, convention room or conference room and it's just two of you talking um, you can hear yourself loud and clear all of a sudden you know 50 of your closest friends come in that room and you're all trying to have your own conversation we've all experienced it 
or in a restaurant, what happens? The volume goes up. And as that volume goes up, the same thing happens with RF. The radios have to boost the power to get their communication back and forth clear. And that creates noise. And the noise impacts performance. And it's a vicious cycle. On a private wireless, you basically have a dedicated you know, communication because you're the only ones you control who is on that and how many people are on it. And you can also control the applications that are on it. Um, so the performance all the way around, uh, the capacity is just greatly enhanced. Yeah, and I guess to, to add to that, um, like you said, you control who's on it. Clearly a big benefit to that is, is cybersecurity, right? right? So if I've right. got an enterprise where I, I want the network you know, solely for the use of my own enterprise, yeah, I could have outsiders physically in my building, but I can prevent them from getting on that network, which gives me another layer of security from, from cybersecurity standpoint, right? Yeah. Again, you control it. And the other thing that's happened that makes that even a little bit easier, though, because we're all familiar with the SIMs, the physical SIMs, where you have to, you know, when you change phones, go to the phone store and get the, the new SIM updated or have them reprogram a new one and so forth. So uh, one of the things that's evolved um, recently is the eSIM. And a lot of the handheld devices are supporting that. And one of the advantages that does is I can be a guest, I can enter your network and you can print out a QR code. I scan that with my camera, just like we do at restaurants or whatever with menus. And with that, it takes my data. I answer a few questions and boom, all of a sudden now I'm authorized to be on that network, your network. And so it makes that process very simple. And then likewise, you can timestamp it so that uh, it controls how long I have access to it. Or one of the things that we're, um, Apple has done with some of the new releases is they have geofencing. So likewise, you can set it up so that as I approach a, pri a building, I can, or I'm an employee, I go from a public cellular network, and as I enter the building, I get switched over to the private network. Um, or in healthcare, where we're seeing it real big is, uh, we have customers that are deploying thousands of uh, Apple phones to run their Epic or other patient devices, healthcare devices on it. They issue, while you're on shift, one of their Apple iPhones, but you don't have to worry about um, it being stolen because once they leave with that geofencing, once they leave the, the, the fence, so to speak, that phone is rendered useless. It's just not going to function, so it has no value. Um, but then while it's on the network, it has all the capabilities and features of a private wireless network, and it's secure, and you know, and they don't have to use their private or their personal, excuse me, uh, devices for that. And it can be, uh, you know, healthcare or hospital issued devices. And uh, we're seeing a lot of interest in that area. I, I know that we've covered a lot of topics, and this is one that I've been hit with late recently. So I'm going to throw this at you. <laughs> see what kind of feedback you know there seems to be a demand for enterprise with under 10,000 square foot looking for better solutions both you know public uh, Wi-Fi and private network is does does those solutions exist yet are we too early in this game or what are you seeing for those smaller you know venues but they want to provide a better service to their you know their their users. One of the areas, again, kind of tied to CBRS is there's what's called Mocken or pronounced Mokin. Um, and uh, it's starting to gain traction. It's not, it's not a technical issue. It's more of a commercial issue. And, and what that is, is it allows you to deploy or the customer to deploy a private wireless network, um, which would be from a deployment cost about 30% less or 40% less than to deploy a repeater or DAS solution. And you provide, connect a gateway to it that then has the connection to the carrier's networks. And the reason I say it's coming about, it's it's been proven out. We've actually have a, our own mocking gateway that we've tested out. 
the two leading carriers are supporting that because what they recognize, and I think the other one will come around is, hey, in these venue styles that you just mentioned, Wayne, is the carrier's not gonna provide funding to do this. It doesn't meet their profile. They're not getting the biggest bang for the buck. Um, and what they're doing is, uh, hey, the customer's gotta pay for this and the, and the customer can do this for less cost and yet the customer experience is adequate and acceptable to us, very similar to what they did eventually over the years, a few years ago with Wi-Fi handoffs, same concept is they're supporting it. And so this is getting played out, um, you know, um, so there's been some deployments, hasn't uh, gotten general acceptance where you can predict and guarantee to a customer that uh, this solution can be offered in their particular scenario, but it's something that's coming on, it's gaining steam. And I think uh, particularly by next year, we'll see uh, that embraced more so and there'll be more rollouts. So more to come on that. That's awesome. a great, awesome. great, uh, great summary. I really appreciate the, uh, the insight, Jeff. You, uh, you guys are clearly square in the center of where private networks are going. And so uh, we really appreciate you sharing your experience with the with our listeners. Tell uh, tell our listeners how they can connect with you and, and your company, RF Connect. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, RF Connect, our website, www.rfconnect.com. Um, my personal contact is jdh at rfconnect.com. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Jeff. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to hearing more down the road on how these uh, private networks are, networks are uh, progressing. Take care. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the 5G Guys. For more resources and to connect with Dan and Wayne, check out their website at 5GGuys.com. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit that follow button and share this episode with your friends and family.